This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Hello and welcome to another edition of Silent Voices, the only program in America that you, the viewer, can voice your opinion on the child welfare system. I'm Dennis Lawrence and beside me is Maria Malin. Maria, we just attended the rally in Lansing, Michigan, and um, I'd like to thank Adina Carl and Alexandra Cervantes for putting this on and we're going to go back to that rally today to show some videos. So I want to thank those two young ladies for putting on such a good show. Today we will go back and take a look at some of those speeches that were presented at the rally. First off, one of our organizers of the rally, Adina Carl. Alex helped put this on so everybody could tell their story. Um, my story is just as equally twisted, but before I go to it, I think it's funny because I just recently put a post on Facebook that said the reason that the Ten Commandments can't be put up into government buildings and courthouses is thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not steal, and thou shalt not uh, cheat would cause a hostile work environment. Yep. Um, <laughs> I don't even know where to begin. Like, I'm both parentally alienated from my two oldest, and CPS took my youngest. So I fall on both sides of the family court issues. And it's just as a, an atrocity, uh, like, it's chaos. It's an alternate reality. Like, I haven't seen my youngest since February 14th of 2012, which was my goodbye visit. Um, I got an hour with my daughter and nobody had told her or explained to her what had been going on. It was my responsibility to inform her that there were no more visits, that I wasn't mommy. And I found out five minutes before the visit was supposed to be over that my daughter had no clue. Um, I promised her on that day that I would never stop fighting, that no matter what the court said, no matter what the appellate court said, that I was always going to fight for her. In my mind, I can't achieve full happiness without my children. I feel right. guilty if I have even a little bit of happiness because how can I even enjoy myself? How can I be happy? How can I smile? without them there, without knowing what's going on with them, without being able to see them, without being able to hug them. You essentially took away my life That's right. without killing me because I'm walking Killing around without my heart. I walk around without my soul. That's right. um, my kids were my motivation. They were my drive. I might not have made the right decisions or the best decisions, but I try everything I did was for them. It was because of them. Um, my biggest gripe with the family court is that they are so uncaring and there's no compassion and there's no understanding and there's no explanation. When we say restart structuring the family court, the family court doesn't go off a burden of proof. Anybody that's dealt with the family court knows that somebody can say something to a caseworker. They don't even have to go into the courthouse. They don't even have to go into the courtroom. You don't get to face your accuser. You don't even get to know who your accuser is. 
there is no investigation into what the accuser's motivation can be. There's only an investigation into you. And even if they find out their investigation might have basis or you might not be the perpetrator and somebody else might be, there's no further investigation into that person. It's still the focus is on that parent. That parent has to go. A child is always going to have a bond with its parents, regardless of how unhealthy the situation may be. It doesn't matter if there's addiction, if there's abuse. It doesn't matter. There's always going to be a bond. Every state, every agency gets money for the care of these children under the best interest of these children. It funds outside families, puts our kids with outside families, with the outsider, with people they don't know, in situations that they can't be protected, in situations that the state has proven not to protect the children. If that funding was put back into these families that might have lifestyle concerns, might not be healthy. There might be some things going on that can be fixed. At the end of the day, the state gets enough money to put these parents through rehab, to put these parents through counseling, get these kids into the proper doctors, get people off food stamps and help with jobs. And that money could do unmentionable things and make the weakest family unit one of the strongest yes. family units that's right. and there is no focus on family family is not a focus yet that's what's in the best interest of the child even in the worst case scenarios it's up to us and we're the only ones that can make a difference we need to raise awareness and we need people to find out what the system is like before it becomes their problem most people don't know what this is until they're the target or they know somebody that's a target. I walked into a family courtroom and thought, you have to prove this beyond a reasonable doubt. I got this in the bag. No, they didn't have to have any proof. They didn't have to have any doctor's report. They didn't have to have any police report. They didn't even pull the detective in. In fact, I had a prosecutor in family court that tried to say there were charges going to be pressed and all kinds of stuff. And a detective that said, oh, no, we don't think anything happened. But they can do this in a family court. That's criminal. You can go into a family court and lie on me, that's right. but I can't go into family court and talk the truth. Right, that's true. This has got to stop. Things have got to change. We need to pay attention for the things that are on the ballot. Like Maria pointed out, we need to raise the awareness. The people that don't know what's going on are the ones we want to reach. We already know what it's about. We already know what it's like. We don't need the education. We need to reach the people that don't know because those are where the numbers are at. And we need to gather everybody and start making a difference. I love that woman for the courage that she shows. Uh, we had her in our studio and she put on a very good show and she did a very good job there in Lansing. Another one of the organizers of this rally and we had her in our studio as well as Alexandria Cervante now she is currently appealing her termination in court and her fight continues let's go to that clip involved with the cps system in december of 2012 um, my baby was found and he had some bruises on his back. And so I took him to the emergency room and that's how CPS got involved. So as a mother, I'm gonna do whatever it takes to keep my child because I've heard about CPS from friends, family. And so there's a service plan that you have to go through. I completed everything and beyond. I got, I was, and then I found out that I was also pregnant. So before I had my second child, I made it a goal to have my firstborn back into my care. I completed that and then to find out um, I had my room under guardian so nobody would find out I was having my second child. Um, and then the big thing about my case is that the father is a criminal. He is affiliated with just uh, guns and all that stuff. Nothing to do with me. I am not the same person as him and that's what the court has made it to be. There is um, 
With that being said, there has been a doctrine, a one-parent doctrine, that supports a parent to be classified as individuals because what happened to me is I was classified as a criminal with the father of my kids. But, and then with that being said, eight days later after I left the hospital with my second child, the father of my kids caught another case and CPS came and took both my kids. Um, I was breastfeeding at the time. They, and then I got to see my baby two weeks later after they took my eight day old. And when he was two weeks, I met, I met the CPS worker at McDonald's and my baby's testicles and his buttocks, he's two weeks old, mind that, and they were bleeding. I reported it, we got a court hearing about it, and then you know what they told me? They said it was my breast milk. <laughs> that is the best thing for a baby. The reason my baby's butt at two weeks old when he was bleeding, that's neglect. And that was in the foster home that he's currently in. And these, this family that he's currently with, they want to adopt my kids. But I feel that there are three different kinds of foster families. There's the ones that do it for a good cause. The second is they're doing it searching for babies. The third is they're searching for babies to make money. Because the foster family that has my kids right now, they're making about $1,200 a month. And I'm telling you, they have made it hard for me to get my children back under my care because they're pushing for adoption. And that's what needs to be changed. These foster homes are not pre-adoption homes. That's what it's pretty much looking like because babies especially are so in demand by other people, like I said, for either just having babies or having babies for the money. And the way that the family court system is funded, that's the big issue that needs to be changed because there's more incentives towards adoptions and parental alienation through the FOC, that there needs to be incentives towards reuniting families. Um, my current situation in the, um, the uh, courts, I'm in the Court of Appeals right now trying to get my uh, termination reversed back to the lower court. I'm going through Eaton County. Um, <clears throat> so that's my story. Also, there's, um, Complaint forms I would like everyone to fill out because we're all here because we are not pleased by what we have been shown by the courts. So they are in the back back there and it shows you how to file a complaint. I try to make it as easy as possible. There's also an investigation form in the back also to investigate a judge, to investigate the courts. So if you could please fill that out, it will definitely help us try and make this movement and make a change. So thank you all for coming. And if anybody else wants to speak, um, just go ahead and come out. Yes. Yes. No, they are not, um, they cannot pro, they cannot finalize any adoption until my appeal has been denied or if it goes back to lower court and they still find that I am guilty of being a good mom. So no, adoption will not proceed until it is finalized by the Court of Appeals. But even with that being said, you can still, even if the Court of Appeals doesn't look at your case and denies you, you can take it up to Supreme Court. And that's my next thing if I, if I don't win this fight with the Court of Appeals. So. No, I do not get to see my kids. I haven't seen my kids since January. So, yeah, my, my uh, child is going to be one in August, and I have not a clue what he looks like. And um, we, I was just at a review hearing that I didn't get notified, but my court, my appellate attorney did get notified about it. And so I went, and they were calling my mom and dad and myself outsiders. Like, my blood isn't running through those children. They said, you, if, because um, my parents are trying to adopt as well. And so... They said if when the parents start getting visitation, that they're not allowed to bring any pictures of me. But mind this, that the foster mom raised her hand in court and said, well, can I, can I bring a picture of myself and show it to Malachi, my oldest, in case he gets scared? I don't know <laughs> what's wrong with these people, but something needs to be 
done. They're going to keep getting away with this. Our Constitution needs to be just taken seriously in these courts because we're being, the, our constitutional rights are being overseen and it's getting easier and immunity. easier every immunity. time. That's why yep. they immunity. Got immunity. Exactly. Mm hmm Yep. So we can do this. This is just the beginning. And I do plan on holding a marathon in the um, to raise awareness in the fall. So right. I hope we can gain more supporters there. So and like I said, if you could please fill out some of these forms, it would help. It would help towards the change. So thank you. And anyone else? Um we also have waters over here if anybody's thirsty. So thank you so much. Thank you, Adia and Alexandria, for putting that rally on. Another speaker was Sherry Ruiz. Grandparents that wanted to foster and adopt their grandchildren denied by the state. A daughter that did everything the state had asked her to do, yet they insisted on terminating her parental rights. Hi, my name is Cherie, and this is my daughter, Lisette, and we've been in the system since October 2nd, when the day they took my two grandkids away from me. Um, on this side is my grandson, Crescencio, we call him Melon, and on the other side is baby Jordan, and we call her Sissy. This little boy right here, when he left our home, he was the best little angel in the world. We didn't have too much time with Jordan yet. He's so loving. He's in the home Head Start, and he, he loves his sister so much, he took his sister to school for show and tell. Three months ago, we went to court in front of um, a referee, and at the time, the foster parents said, oh, they're doing so good, and, and recently, we just went back to court, and all of a sudden, the foster parent stands up and has these horrible stories about my grandson, and it was such an angel, and I'm not saying this just because he's my grandson. He's been brought up with love and respect, all of a sudden now he breaks windows supposedly. He's harming his sister and the dogs and the, they can't control him. First of all, he sh they shouldn't be foster parents if they can't control a four year old. What if they would have been placed with a baby that would had a drug addiction or was really abused at home and had autism or some kind of mental retardation? Do in that situation, a grown man stands up and says this about my grandson. My hands are shaking right now because there's no way, and what it is, is that these people want to adopt. And all in the, from the beginning, there's been reunification. My daughter has gone above and beyond everything on her own. I stand by her side. I got put on a central registry list because they didn't want the kids to come with me. They told me pretty much, don't fight for your kids. I got a lawyer. I got my name removed. They still said I couldn't have my grandkids. My home was okay. It was all approved. They went through every little step. They waited till the last day before we went to court and told me that I cannot have my grandkids until my daughter is okay. And all this stems from postpartum depression. My daughter asked for help while she was pregnant. She asked for help for four or five, four months after she was pregnant. Sparrow Hospital even sent over to Sparrow Professional Building to her doctor's office saying this is an emergency and, my, and that my daughter needs to be seen and given medic medication for postpartum depression. They canceled once again out of six times. So my kids, my grandkids are in a foster home. My daughter gets to see them. It was three times a week, one day, one hour a day. Now it's went up to five hours because she can't have a home yet because she doesn't bring enough food, as they say, to feed them. But like I said, my grandson, Crescencio, over here, he is going through the worst thing ever. Jordan was only four months, so she doesn't know. They have my grandkids calling them mom and dad. Crescencio is so confused. Um, he can't, there, there's no way you're ever going to break that bond between us and our grandson and my daughter. He has that bond and that's what's wrong with her. Her name is Amy. The foster father is named John. And to me, I think it's all about money. There's nothing wrong with my home. There's nothing wrong with my daughter's home. My daughter's been through hell and back, and I'm sorry to use that word. And she's still going through it. And she's not going to stop fighting for her kids. They can take as long as they want, but my grandson knows me there. And just recently... The foster mom took his toy away. Like, really? You can take a toy away from a little four-year-old just to hurt his feelings more? She, 
I feel like when, when there's reunification involved in the situation, kids should not be placed in a home with the foster parents that are expecting to adopt a kid. Right. They can't have their own kids. Exactly. And you don't set up and, if you're a foster parent, you treat somebody with respect and dignity. Yes. Don't treat my grandson and hurt him okay. to make him act out in the wrong way that he shouldn't be acting because he has never had that problem at home. I don't even have to discipline. I don't, I don't have to yell at him. He knows what's wrong and right. He's a very loving child. And like I said, this is all about adoption and money and what they can get out of them. And she's not going to take my grandkids away. But here's my daughter. Okay. Well, she can't talk. She's sad. <laughs> but I, we lost our grandma, my mom, in July. My daughter had her baby in May. And that's the only blue-eyed little baby we have in our whole family. The rest of us are dark hair, brown eyes. She looks just like my mom. So that's our little baby Juju there. And my daughter, like I said, she's, and I'm not just saying this because it's my daughter, but she made some of the best kids ever. And we're gonna stand up and fight for them forever, yeah. no matter what we have to do. So like I said, there needs to be more help with these parents being able to get their kids back home when there's reunification. Never once have they re reached out to my daughter and asked if she need help with counseling. They don't ask if she needs help with anything. They don't ask if she needs help and do anything. All they do is try to put her down in every little situation there is. This, like I said, I, I, really you're complaining about what she brings for lunch. And then when she'll bring lunch, the mother already, the foster mother will already have fed them. And she can't even ask them questions like, why are you acting out? Why are you doing this? Because it's, it's just like, you can't even talk to your kids. You can't say anything. But all I'm saying is that there are fam families out here that do deserve to have their kids taken away and it needs to be investigated, but investigate and do your job. Don't just take them away just because you assume something bad is going on. And that's our, in our situation, they never even checked on other family members that we asked them to. They just took them away. So it's been going on since eight, October 2nd. What is today? So we're, I don't know, we go back to court September 19th and we're hoping for them to come home. But like I said, the foster parents stood up in court and said, my little Crescencio over here is not welcome in his home anymore. Do you guys think that that should be a foster parent? I think they need to look in the background of these foster parents that they're giving. We also had a family member that's been a friend of the family for 17 years, went through all the whole foster system, became a foster parent, and they would not let her adopt these kids, or let the, her foster my grandkids, but she can adopt, foster other kids in the system <coughs> through Lutheran Children's Services, but she can't foster ours. And it makes no sense. Everything that we do that they tell us to do, when it's, when it's done and over with, they come with something else new. So we're getting closer, hopefully, and they will be back home with us. And I just want to say that I'm so proud of you, Lisey, for everything that you've done. And you over there, this lady, I want to tell you I'm proud of you for standing up for up here. Okay? Yeah. Bye. Heartbreaking stories in Lansing. Families being ripped apart by the state of Michigan. We'll be right back after these messages. If you would like to be a guest on Silent Voices, contact us at miparentalrights at gmail.com. That's miparentalrights at gmail.com. All right. I don't like my parents take me to church three times a week. Since when is church attendance considered to be harmful? They make me go to church every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I'm tired of them telling me what to do. And this makes you feel isolated and depressed. I'm prepared to sit here all night until you agree to opt our son out and give us parental notification. That's all we're asking for. Because parental rights are not written down in the text of the Constitution, it's up to judges to define. Stop. Enough is enough. I was angry that they dared to even place this in the hands of my five-year-old son. Dave, where'd you get this? Jake had it at school. 
Why? I didn't know. Um, I didn't know what other discussions had taken place. And they teach this in kindergarten? Apparently so. In kindergarten? This is about introducing to my child sexuality issues at a very early age. We both decided we still want Jake updated out of these lessons. I'm afraid we can't do that. When I was let out and put in the police car, I thought to myself, how far are they willing to go to deny us our parental rights? This generation has to fight to preserve and protect parents' rights in the Constitution in the United States. One of two people will decide. It will be a bureaucrat or a parent. It's a parent's duty to control and direct the upbringing of that child. These you are the federal guidelines that I have to obey. His mother and I want his lab results. And you do know that you're under no obligation to show the results to your parents if you don't wish to. The only way I can release that information is if your son gives me permission. It's the law. Then the law is wrong, doctor. The international law threat is the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. If that becomes the law of this country, then every parenting decision will go through the filter of the UN's standards for how children should be raised. This treaty that purports to give rights to children really makes children more vulnerable to being exploited and abused. Eric believes that his parents are imposing their religion upon him in an excessive manner. Do you want to have an adult in the government deciding what's best for your child? Or do you want to be in that position? I think once a week church attendance is sufficient for a 13-year-old boy. So be it. I want to thank you, the viewers, for watching this week. You can catch us next week, same time, same channel. Until next week, my friends, remember, your, your voice, voice makes, makes the, the difference. difference.